federal government has said that there was no bias in the payment of salaries to members of the Academic Staff Union of Nigeria, ASU. The government pointed out the members of ASU were paid their October salary pro rata and not half salary, as reported. A statement by the head of Press and Public Relations, Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment, Olajide Oshundum, explained a pro rata was done because they cannot be paid for work that they didn't do. So, what are your thoughts? Do you think the federal government should pay, or do you think their payment could set a precedence of, ah, it's okay, you can go on strike? What are your thoughts on this? Please. I always knew that at the end of the day, the students would be at the receiving end of this. Because right now, nobody's thinking about the students' well being. Uh, you know, ASO has stayed off uh, from work for eight months. Now they want to come back. And the argument is they are going to jump pack everything they had lost. Uh, students will now begin to do crash courses, take examinations, and so that they can mop up the time lost, you know. Everything will be crashed. And I am worried about that because we have always sat here to complain that most times we have half-baked students. It's not about jump packing the whole thing that they have lost. The time frame. You, there's a time frame in curriculum that when you teach, there's an expected time for assimilation, for understanding. They're not putting that into consideration. You want to come and rush the whole work so that you can get your pay. I think it's unfair on the students. So I would have said, since all of us are tight, tightening our belts, we want to we want the revitalization uh, uh, funding to be done. We want to be able to have proper infrastructure, lecturers paid properly. Mm. Can't we all suffer this mm. and move the session? So don't, don't crush it. Don't put it together. Students need time to assimilate right. and understand. We have lost this session. We repeat that session so that students will have their ample time. Yeah. So now you're just, because you want to get the money, you're just jump back in everything. I do, I do, I, 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 it, it's else? annoying to me. I, I really don't like that. Mm. As one federal government issue, there are no winners. Mm. There are no winners. And I hope ASU has that in, at the back of their mind. The students certainly are the losers here. Yeah. But, you know, between the federal government and ASU, they, are no, they should just, you know, compromise on both sides. No winners, really. Yeah. If federal government is saying their hands are tight, finances are tough and all of that, ASU, your goal was to establish that, you know, certain things be given to the university educational system yeah. in Nigeria. There should be investment and improvement of infrastructure in these schools, and as well as increase in salaries. And all of these have been agreed on. What has passed has passed. Can we mm. leave what we have, you know, lost, lost in the past? Mm. And if they are giving you something to even buffer it, can you just take it and let us move on? Because really, if you ask federal government to start this argument, or we'll no work, no pay, they have laws. So. Mm. That's why the National Industrial Court did not back ASU. On this, strikes will continue to happen if nobody suffers any pain from this, if only the students are suffering. Mm. So if strike happens, the students miss out school time, they, they have more years to spend in university, ASU loses money, it's part of it. Yeah. But you achieve your goal. When people are fighting, the struggle we're seeing in developed countries, everywhere we go to where we see people, the democracy we have today, people died for it. You know, people must be willing to understand that I will make this sacrifice for the greater good. So here's my own. ASU... You have made an amazing sacrifice. I am happy a lot of children are back in school. Don't, don't, don't water down the huge activity that you have done it's by being petty with how much and how much back and forth. Stay your ground that all the promises be fulfilled. All the monies they will give for capital invest, investment into the education sector, Going all forward. of them should come through. When, when we are trying to fix, we are solution conscious. Mm. I don't know, fix a problem. You see, we must, we, we understand government wants to do carrot and stick, but sometimes where, you know, listen, I'm trying to get, I'm, going, I'm trying to put palliatives in mm. for, for ASU. I'm trying to bring them back to say, you know, we are here for, for you. you. When, you, when, you when, when you have a government that is leading, not ruling. Mm. But I keep hearing people talk about the, the rulers. Mm. We've passed that level of rulers. It's we need rulers. leaders in government mm. who are saying, okay, you eight months, you're done. Just like you said. October salary, I'll pay you full so salary. It's not even that. It's thinking for the greater good. Aha! Thank What's you so the much. greater good here? Yes. Do you want another set of few weeks it's to negotiate uh -huh. the challenges of yeah. half salary? Why don't we, you know, if we say that we want the greater good, we, we've got these children back into, and it's because the government, we, there's no consequence on the government side, you know? Yeah. The government has put in consequences for us in that you don't get paid when you don't mm. work. There's a law back in it. The children, the students are suffering. There's no lecture. They spend an extra year. What is the government paying for this? If governments get 
the, if they know that I might lose my re-election bid, so you see the American elections, you know, they have midterm. So everybody is working because they know that midterm election, I might lose my seats. Mm. When government realizes the direct impact Fact. of mm. this, and the students, students, go and get your PVC. Thank go you. and join that queue. Because we have enough people in the university to change the total outlook of elections in this yeah. country. <laughs> like if all the students that have been at home for eight months decide they want to vote, they can choose our president. So it's important that government sees the repercussion of the strike as well. Mm. That's where everybody knows what's at stake. So according to reports, the Department of State Services, DSS, said that they are probing allegations of unprofessional conduct by their operatives at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos. The probe followed an allegation by an Abuja-based human rights lawyer, Kolumi Olagwezi, that operatives of that agency particularly begged passengers for money at the airport. Now, we're referencing this story because we know of stories of various extortions by airport officials, either customs, police officers, uh, baggage carriers, different people that extort money in different ways. I never knew DSS officials at airports. I mean, I'm hearing it for the first time. <clears throat> I don't know how accurate that is, but Louis is saying that they did extort him as a DSS officer. However, many have also said various extortions have happened in various groups. I know in my own experience, when I came back, um, first of all, they, 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 they just carried my bag and told me they had to check my bag. And they, I, I didn't say anything. I just kept quiet. As they're trying to open the zip and everything, one of the other attendants recognized me and told the person to stop on zipping. I said, am I the person? Are you Moriah? I said, yes. Oh, please let me greet Tokwe. Greet him. I need my Raja. They zip me back. I said, bye-bye. But imagine if I wasn't real. Of course, they'll open up and I might have to pay something to allow them to, to allow me go. So we see it all the time. They might not come out rightly to ask, well, have you experienced this whenever you traveled? I had that same experience mm. where someone wanted to check my bag. Someone recognized me and said they should not check it. The senior official mm. came back and said, because she's on TV doesn't mean you should not check it. So they yeah, checked. Mm -hmm. And I had to say that. And they opened and I said, well, it was it's a vacation. It's my children's <coughs> clothes. And I opened and they saw that it was children, children clothes. Then they checked another bag. They saw jeans. Mm -hmm. It's okay. She can go. So it on was. On your way back? On my way back. Okay. So okay. it was a case of okay. um, someone recognized her. Someone wanted to say, let her go. And the boss said, no, just because she's on doesn't mean that you should mm -hmm. let her go. Yeah. That was, that's a bit different from. But I've also, I've traveled this several times and they usually would say, greet me and go. They don't even open or carry the bag. Um, extortion. Well, you, yeah, extortion. Extortion. Um, extortion. I, like, I, when I read it, I said, it's not really extortion, but they will just greet you in the way Nigerians greet. And you will know that if you want peace, you will settle mm. and move on. I mean, it's just, it's just when you enter, they want to, to pull, pull and they want to check your back to make sure you didn't bring in any contraband. Oh, but at what point do points. they extort? Several. Sometimes when they're going, going through your bag and flipping through yeah, your bag. I try to board. Then there's a no, conversation. No, no. Especially yeah. when you come in. When yeah. you come in, they're going through your bag and everything. It's usually a conversation. So you're right about the fact that they say, welcome. You know, they'll greet you. I know they'll greet you and they'll greet you. They'll greet you. There's a way they'll say this good as or welcome, anything for us. But then we've also had a conversation, especially in the COVID period, yeah, where people yeah. needed to have their cards. And if you could not get it, they would mm -hmm. offer you a quick fix yeah. and then you pay. So there are just different methods. And, and because we're Nigerians, we know that it's extortion. Yeah. Let me still talk about the airport thing, because when Maya mentioned it, I'd forgotten. So what, um, what, what my my trip during just after COVID, mm. I paid for my COVID test and I and I showed them that I paid for the COVID test. But when I came, they said they did not see my name on the platform, mm. and they kept checking. And I, I like they delayed me. I don't like delayed. settling. I don't even mind delay, but I wouldn't. I don't, I'm not. A, I don't. I don't bribe. Yeah, cause, cause, yeah. So I sat there and I said, I paid for this thing. Check it. This is my receipt. They checked the platform. They said, See, this is where your name would have been. One man passed. They said, See his name. Another person passed. They said, See his own name. Your own name is not there. So I said, So what do you want me to do? Then came the bill. Yes. So I was supposed to transfer to somebody's account, account. and then I, my Wi-Fi was my internet wasn't going through. So somebody actually hold spots for me so that I can have access to my account to transfer, and I settled so that I can pass through. So at the end of the day, the real problem with extortion is that criminality can escape because somebody is greedy. So somebody can smuggle things that shouldn't be in Nigeria into Nigeria because they tip quickly and yes. they will move through. So
don't actually ask, ask you for money. Mm. But I guess we interpret the excessive greeting sometimes mm. as drop something. Yeah. But some people overlook it. Because and, they, and you don't have to, and you, yeah. and you just move yeah. on, you don't have to, and they don't force it out of you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, <clears throat> we ourselves, since we're trying to change the narrative, we have a responsibility not to give. And what I do is I try as much as possible not to break the law so that you cannot hold me to give you anything. Mm. So once I know that I'm not supposed to pack so so and so, I will not pack it. If you search my bag, I'm not supposed to have so so and so, I will yeah. not have it. Yeah. So that if I want to give, it's because I just like your face and I feel well done, man. And which is okay. Nigerians are, we are givers. If yeah. you want to give, really give from your heart. Not that somebody's asking you to give. Not that you have broken the law and you want to give to get mm. out of it. Thanks for staying with us. So we, we, went, we saw a tweet that was interesting to us because it brings us to a different conversation about those of us who come back home or who live abroad. So there was a tweet uh, by, I think it was General underscore Oluchi that said that, I traveled from the US to Lagos, took a flight from Lagos to the east, mm -hmm. and hired a taxi from the airport to my hometown. And the first question a relative greeted me with was, this one that you return to the middle, mm -hmm. in the middle of the year, hope, there's, hope you are well, you should have just sent the money. So according to this um, person, they came home for a funeral, maybe to show the last respects to a loved one. And they spent quite a bit of money to buy tickets, Lagos and Lagos to the, to the States from there, take a taxi. And they spent quite a bit of money. And the relatives, they go, you didn't have to come, just send the money. It is the money we need. Hmm. Now, this brings to the fore a conversation on what are, what, how we value lives, number one, and the perception we have of those who live abroad that, as if they went there to pick money from the ground. We, we've also had stories of family members who travel and the moment they travel, their loved ones believe that, ah, yeah. everything is sorted in our family. All the poverty in our world, and all the problem with our life has been erased because that person has crossed over from Rita Mohammed to anywhere. Doesn't even <laughs> care where the person is, the place is <laughs> right. As long as you left Nigeria, our life family has changed. I believe the people who sell the greener pasture story all the time. When I was a child, you know what we call Lagos in my place? Ewo. That's the... the the uh, privileged or exposed place. People at home will think that when you go to Lagos, you don't work because you don't do the kind of work they do. So they think that they're lesser because they're farmers. But if everybody knows that there's dignity in every kind of work that yeah. they do, work that work. Some people can be in Lagos here, they are working to their death. Mm. Stuck in traffic and all of that. And it's the same die. mentality. Somebody goes abroad and you give the impression that we are migrating for better things. Not that they ah, no, if you just go there on the streets, you pick money. As in, when, when I want to, is coming home, you will not dress on bulo. Mm -hmm. you, you put the pendant, it will be like star, hijab. You give them, give them, give them. You see some people who are in Lagos here, when they work for a full year, they save a full year savings. When they are traveling for December, yeah, traveling into this, they will blow bags of, you know, that's a year's work. But when you get home, you give them the pressure, that's every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they will, uh, we'll just go and be working the money and come. Don't even come again. Just send them. You know, people now forget the values of family. You don't want to see your loved one forever. Make mm. it just the same money. So the value of your relationship is about the money they give you. So I don't mind that. I even call her the other day safe. She never even pick. And it's, uh, you, you think that that person's problem stops just because you have your own. Mm. We're all human and we lost so much and important values. Everywhere. Who is this greener pasture thing? Everywhere. So this is not only a coming from abroad story. Mm. Even within Nigeria, you mm. find some people, someone is sick at home and the person is thinking, and they'll say, instead of putting money to get, into the, get on a bus and come all the way, just send that money instead. Mm. It will go a long way. So I've seen situations where a person will decide, see, all I have is the money for transportation to take me there and come back. And if I put this... And when I get there, I won't be able to give them anything. I can only be there, you know, with them. Is that enough? And I find people have that conversation where they're trying to deal with it. Is it better for me to go and see my sick mom or just send her money towards the hospital bill? So that won't happen. But there's others where you would expect that. See, it's not about the money. I just want to see you. I want to feel you. And that is, it also brings me to the sort of sacrifices people make and how we, you know, we make nonsense of it. She came. She didn't even drop anything. Meanwhile, this one sent us money. That one did not show up.
but this one has been there from the beginning oh, of your yeah, issues, you. helping you, you know, being a moral support. Yes, the person doesn't have all the money, money in the world or any money at all, but the person is there with you when you wake up, when you go to bed, when you're feeling down, the person, you, you need to speak to, the, uh, to someone, the person is there listening. But when they are discussing it, they will talk about how you were there, you did not put any money down, but the one that did not show up, sent money so i'm not making by good so i'm not even making i'm not even making it like maybe the sending money is less yeah. of importance than the person who is there i'm just saying that for whatever you receive be grateful for it we have commercialized relationships mm. and we have believed we, we have come to a place where every relationship has an economic value and we look at human beings and we're saying money as opposed to seeing the human being that they represent seeing their emotions, feeling the love from them, getting the concern from them. But we have turned human beings to the economic value they are bringing to the table, yeah. commercializing every relationship. I also see, ex I see um, what we call, ex no, it's not extortion, it is entitlement mentality from many people. So I have five children. One will become a doctor, you go and work in Canada. One will become a lawyer, will go and work in America. Another one will go to Australia. By the time you are repatriating ABCD for me, I'm sorted. Like, these are not human beings anymore. They are Russia, financial commodities. investments, commodities. And it is extremely wrong. You should not plan your life around another person's pockets. And you should not plan your future on another human being. Um, the host of a major talk show in Nigeria, <laughs> Yogi, you posted something on social media that went viral and we thought it was important for us to discuss. She said, this thing called marriage, eh? Some women need a long-term exit plan. You've got to know when to move. No man is worth high BP. It's not easy, but possible. So the comment um, was inspired as a result of um, a very um, com a conversation that was had with somebody who was going through a hard time. Mm. And, um, and there's somebody that, <coughs> the truth is that the person didn't deserve mm. that experience. You could see the kind of sacrifices the person had made, um, the factors available on the person, the, the factors that led to this. And I think it's yourself, you know, how do you advise? How do mm. you help this person? How do you um, make them still stay because they have to stay, but also have a future plan? Mm. So, so that, that brings the conversation. Do we as women <clears throat> understand somewhere that, okay, when things get hard, how do you know when to move? How do you when to stay? How do you feel that, oh, are you still going to stick to, for better, for worse, no matter what, I'm gonna, will you be there all through? Or at some point, you have a plan? I think that um, when you start to think of an exit plan is when one party has decided that this is not truly a marriage. So a marriage is it's a relationship between two people with the same goals, values, you know, they have put this in before them and they're saying we're going to work together as a team for me it's a team but we have heard of marriages where it seems there's only one person carrying the marriage one person is so selfish would not do anything for the home would not do any would not make any sacrifices or even the barest minimum in helping that home and then you find one of the spouses wife or husband just you know constantly being unhappy that person carries all the burden financial emotional mental everything you know and the other person just checks in to sleep and checks out you know the at the day so it's, <clears throat> there's this uh, movie i think they said married but living singly something mm. single yeah so we have some people like that and i feel that when it gets to that point that is when the person should have an exit plan That's in true sense marriage the two have become one which means their entire lives are intertwined you can't just remove yourself yeah. from a situation mm. so, so when, when people are advising that and what, what was she looking at till they killed her in the marriage how couldn't she have stood up and left it's not easy to just stand up and leave and it is important that there must be um room for that conversation however when i was getting into marriage i the committee of mothers around me felt that it was important to give me sound advice before marriage before i even <clears throat> understood what i was going to experience in the marriage good or bad the conversation was that talk where as you are going to your house, you must keep your your left hand must have something, your right hand must have something, under your feet must have something, <coughs> so that if anything happens, mm. you have where to go. Yeah. And I at first I entered that marriage with that mindset, and I got to meet my husband, and I felt there was no need to be doing left hand keeping, right hand keeping in that setting, even though I 
he had given me freedom to my own money. So I did not need to be keeping it. Yeah. He does not touch it even if he sees it. So why should I be keeping it? But they, were, they had advised me based on their own experiences. Yeah. Mm. And I could have brought it into, I, I brought it in and it was causing friction. And I just realized that man made friction. I'm the one causing this friction, no? Mm. If I did, it's not, it's not them, it's, 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 they're not in my marriage. Yeah. So I think it's important that when we are getting advice, we should take it on the face value of thank you for advising me, but is it relevant to my life? My situation right is now. Is it relevant to my <coughs> situation? So if they say have a long-term exit plan, look at your life. Do I want to exit this wonderful marriage? No. Thank you for the advice. So, uh, when you are getting into marriage, I want to believe that it's best that you go wholeheartedly. Uh, it's best that you hope for the best. Uh, some people were raised to always be ready for any situation. And so they've had experiences, they've seen their parents, they've seen their siblings, people around them and what they had experienced. And they get into marriage with that mindset of, if you come for me, I'm ready for you, guns blazing. But when you get into a marriage with somebody that you have decided to go the long haul with somebody that you love, it's best that both parties go in wholeheartedly with their hearts. And then whatever situation comes up from that institution, you handle day to day. And also do not go in with unnecessary expectations as if uh, anybody is perfect. We are all human beings. Mistakes will be made. Uh, people are not perfect. Things will go wrong. You go in with the mindset of forgiveness. However, it comes, I'll be able to forgive. However, there are some marriages that even after you've done all that you can, the marriage gets to a point where it becomes toxic. If you're in an abusive relationship where you are being beaten, battered, emotionally. mentally, you know, emotionally, financially, you are in that sort of relationship, that is when this advice comes mm. into play. Mm. So you assess the situation. If I stay here in the next five years, am I sure that I can go out with my life? If I am not sure, you must have an exit plan. <laughs>